Hi, and welcome to Cave to the Cross Apologetics. I'm Tony. I'm Patrick. And today we are continuing our trek through the book, um, Why Should I Believe Christianity by James Anderson. Right. And we are, we've worked our way up to chapter four. And here he's going to talk about um, basically, uh, well, the name of the chapter is God is There. And he's going to give actually some some arguments for the existence of God and why we should uh, believe that God exists, mm -hmm. right? So this is kind of one of those meaty type of chapters right. where we're going to get into some relatively heavy, heavy stuff. Right? right, yeah. So if you've heard of uh, TAG before or Transcendental Argument, uh, the, this is the the um, kind of overview, uh, getting your feet wet type yeah. deal. So yeah. Um, yeah, if some of the... Uh, the uh, issues that we cover are a little heady. Um, the, there's more to come, so it builds upon that. And uh, so if you don't hear enough now, uh, wait until the coming chapters where he'll cover a bit more. And then also uh, you can go to the, uh, the YouTube videos and we break up um, kind of each thought area mm -hmm. into a smaller clip so yeah. you can check them out there yeah so let's 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 kind of dive in and kind of hang on here because we're gonna we're gonna go kind of yeah deep if you thought here, right? theology took three <laughs> three episodes yeah this chapter we're only going to get probably through a third maybe <laughs> who knows yeah so. um so the first thing he, you know, he, he considers here, he asks uh, whether God exists or he, he uh, makes a statement whether God exists and what kind of God exists is surely one of the most fundamental issues addressed by any worldview, right? So last time we looked at the Christian worldview. And so this issue of the ex existence of God, he says, is one of the most fundamental issues, right? right? A foundational tenet of the Christian worldview is that God is real, Indeed, God is the ultimate reality, mm -hmm. right? God is the absolute being above and behind all other beings. So in this chapter, what he's going to do here is consider some of the excellent reasons he tells us for believing that God is real. Right. And, and he's going to say it's not some vague, generic deity that he's going to look at, but the God of the Bible, mm -hmm. right? The God that Jesus spoke about. So he's going to be relatively specific in terms of, you know, not just theism in general, mm -hmm. right? But, um, but the God of the Bible. Right. In fact, he's going to argue that if uh, God isn't real, notice nothing makes sense in this world. Mm. So that's kind of a, head, a, a heavy claim. Right. right. Yeah. right. It, 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 God shoulders a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We asked the question, can God be proven? And mm. so this is, mm. is talking about, well, you know, can we can we slice off uh, uh, God's toenail? Can we look at it under a microscope? Uh, what does that do? Yeah. And uh, I, I, you know, for for the the Christian understanding, uh, since we believe in a Trinity and an incarnation, um, you know, that's that's entirely doable from from that perspective. Yeah. Although not yeah. now, right? Immediately. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, there, there's work on the Shroud of Turin and and all that jazz. But uh, what we're kind of talking about here is is kind of the the the, the Godhead. In heaven, can can we kind of uh, can we prove that even yeah. even remotely? Right. In uh, other words, can we prove the Christian God? <laughs> really, right. is what he right right. right. That's so, the question. So we're not. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Anderson comes from uh, the presuppositional um, uh, track, and so um, it, it's uh, it's not a um, uh, a, a generic uh, de deity, monotheistic deity, and then you add Jesus on top of it to kind of get Christianity. It start, starts from. Uh, if, if the God of the Bible is true, what are the kind of implications right, for that? Right. So, and if the God of the Bible isn't true, then what are the implications of that? Right, right. right kind of thing. Right. So the, the way in which uh, we might prove the existence of a thing will depend on the nature of the thing. Right. Kind of makes sense, right? right. So if you're trying to uh, uh, um, test for the visibility of air, well, that, that might be hard. Hard, harder to do, at least. <laughs> yeah, when I read this, it, was, it reminded me of Bonson's, uh, you know, the great debate where he talked about <laughs> right. proving crackers in the cupboard it was different than, a, you know, there's there's a different way to prove crack, whether crackers are in the cupboard as opposed to some other things, right? Yeah. You don't prove everything in the same way kind of thing, right? <laughs> but, well, people need to be more red, so we get crackers in the cupboard type <laughs> examples. <laughs> so so it depends on the nature of the thing, on what kind of thing it is. Yeah. So the God of the Bible is not at all like everything else. Indeed, according to Christianity, God is fundamentally and radically different from every other thing in existence. 
and uh, we'll we'll kind of cover that uh, um, a, a little bit more as, as we unpack uh, the chapter here. Mm. Uh, but unlike the deities of the Greek and Roman mythology, God isn't a being who exists within the universe as part of it. And so uh, I've talked about that before. You know, you have you have Zeus uh, being hid, uh, so his, his father doesn't eat him, but it still exists within this universe type thing. It's yeah. it's in a in an ether and a. Uh, you know, the, the understanding of the makeup of the universe, uh, ether is this kind of element within the understanding that kind of has always existed. In fact, up until the development of the Big Bang, you had a, an idea of, of kind of a solid state universe of yeah. of uh, one that has always existed. And so um, the, the, the fact that um, that uh, skeptics now use Big Bang cosmology as as a slight against uh, 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 deists of, of of some kind um, is uh, is actually a strange position for them to to take, um, and so God, we we find God in the Bible as we covered uh, a couple episodes ago. Um, he's there in the beginning, and then He creates. He's yeah. not there within some concept of of you know Mount Olympus or right. or uh, you he, know, he's not part of the creation. Yeah. He's separate from the creation. He, he doesn't because... come out of the Nile right. and is divided <laughs> up into twelve parts and. Uh, you know, his his mom doesn't pluck him out of a tree or, so, or something <laughs> along those lines. Um, he he exists, and then there's the beginning of all of the existence that we know. Uh, so rather, God is a spiritual being uh, who transcends both space and time. God isn't part of the universe because God created the universe. So right. he exists outside the universe, but that doesn't mean he can't enter into the universe. It, it, it doesn't mean that he has... Uh, Created and then uh, you know he he just made something way too simple that even he can't communicate. Um, again, we're, we're we're looking at this from um, what are the implications of the God of the Bible uh, yeah. being being true, and so yeah, the, these are the qualities. And so, since God is um, created the universe and he's not part of it, then you know Anderson tells us this means that we can't detect God in the way that we could for instance, detect other things in the universe, right? right? Because he's not part of the universe. Mm -hmm. He's different, right? And I like he our, transcends the universe. Right. Right? I like our analogy of, of the computer program. The computer program can go out and search for errors. You know, you have your debugging program, and then you have your, your uh, you know, that's your language, and then um, you, you have your program that actually does the task at hand. Well, that, that doesn't at all touch on who the creator of that computer program is right, right but the fact that they still because exist. the creator isn't part of the program right, right. so we can't right. say well let's look at the program so that we can you know mm -hmm. you know get a piece of the right. creator's what did you say toenail right, <laughs> right <yeah. laughs> you know just a small piece yeah. the, the, the pinky toe yeah <laughs> yeah so 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 the 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 computer program would be incorrect in saying that humans don't exist because it doesn't find it within the scope of its program right but yeah. the intelligence that designed it has done it uh, the debugging program that that kind of uh, keeps everything in line and tells you when it can run when it can't run uh, what to do if then statements uh, so uh, you have a form of logic that enters into mm -hmm. the computer program but if it says okay now let me find a, a being of all ones and zeros well that doesn't that doesn't happen <laughs> because that being exists uh, para, only within para para outside uh, right. the computer <laughs> and so yeah so we really can't detect god in the way that we could detect you know right. uh toenail clipping <laughs> uh so how can then god's existence be proved if we can't detect him in what we would say the usual way right well he says here's the answer we have to um uh, uh, you know look at look at it in a different way and so mm -hmm. that's what he's going to uh, unpack here for the rest of this chapter so even though god cannot be directly perceived you know like ordinary things within the universe it turns out he says that we cannot make sense of the ordinary things uh, that we do perceive in the you know in the universe as a whole unless god exists Mm -hmm. So that's the idea here, right? Unless God exists, we're not going to be able to make sense of anything else that we can perceive in the universe. Um, you know, so in short, only a worldview centered on a transcendent, perfect, personal creator can make rational sense of the very things that we take for granted all the time. Right. And so that's the approach that he's going to take. Right. We can't detect God directly. But we can't make sense of all the things that we can detect directly unless God exists. Right. 
Right. That's the idea. Um, and we, we did cover some of this in uh, Nancy Piercy's uh, F- Finding Truth one, so you can go back and watch those episodes. And also, um, in Mitch Stokes' book, uh, How to Be an Atheist, he talked about this idea of uh, being careful of scientism, that mm-hmm. this idea that science is the only way of establishing knowledge. Well, even good scientists will say, well, it doesn't really establish knowledge. It just establishes the best explanation for we have at the time. Right. And so, uh, you know, Dr. Stokes talks about, you know, being wary of saying the science says, (laughs) scientists say, and here's the uh, best scientific theory at the time. Right. And so you, you have the idea of like, oh, it's the God in the gaps and science has explained away these things. But you could just as easily say this is atheism, the gap, and then right. this is just whatever's the placeholder, <laughs> and it's assuming that atheism uh, or, or some some naturalistic explanation will explain away the, the thing in the end. So we have to be careful that uh, of this idea that science is the only way of attaining knowledge, which that's not entirely true because right. saying science is the only way of attaining knowledge, how do you scientifically determine that yeah yeah we got it yeah that we, gets us into yeah. a problem right yeah. so there won't be <laughs> that's a philosophical for... statement about <laughs> yeah. science it's not a scientific statement right and therefore we can't prove it in the way we would a scientific statement right, right? and so if you say the science is the only way to knowledge well that statement can't be proven so it's kind of you know defeats itself Right. right. Oops. Right. right. So it's, it's, it's internally inconsistent and so it fits. <laughs> uh, so he goes on to say that uh, it is worth taking a moment to reflect on just how much hangs on the question of God's existence. So why is this an important question? So, right, right. you know, if, if God, you know, um, creates the universe, speeds it up, uh, gets it to where it's at. Yeah. So, okay, that's good. I'm moving on to uh, my second home. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check back with it in 32 billion years and we'll see how it, how it tr- transcends. Uh, uh, so the universe we inhabit would, uh, much would, would be much the same, whether or not some things exist. So not so with God, if God exists, that affects everything simply because of who God is. Yeah. So, so, you know, basically, and he uses, uh, he uses an illustration here about the Yeti, right? You yeah. know, which is kind of a <laughs> mythical beast that uh, walks on two legs and has white fur, I think. And I mean, it's, you know, it's almost like, uh, the, uh, uh, Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. in, in uh, Monsters Inc., he's you know a, a monster banished to to the Arctic. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah. now you know what the Yeti is. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So if the Yeti exists, the fact that it exists, oh, that's interesting. But, what is it? We can yeah. kind of study it. But you know, has it psychologically affected your your mindset yeah. for or for, what kind of influence would that have right. or effect on the universe? You know, as a whole. Probably not a whole lot, right? Right. right. <laughs> does, does the understanding that the Yeti exists also affect that um, Mars ha- had a climate at one time? <laughs> you know, maybe if, yeah. maybe the Yeti escaped from Mars so, or something like that. Oh. <laughs> so he's probably back there, and that's why we can't. Oh, you solved the the problem of the Yeti. Yeah. All right. Write that one up, and we'll publish it. We, right? we need a, Elon Musk to, to, to come prove our Yeti That's theory. That's right, right. We'll, 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 we'll be paid in Dogecoin. <laughs> <laughs> the universe we inhabit would be uh, um, much the same. And so if if, uh, if God if we found out that God exists, well, everything else depends for its existence and nature on God. Right. So, so, again, so it's if, a different kind of situation, right? God versus the Yeti. Okay, fine. Yeah. If the Yeti exists or not, that's really, you know, it not that big a deal. Yetis. But if God, <laughs> right, exists, now we're into a whole different kind of issue, right? right? It's a huge issue. Right. It's an impactful issue, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> so th- think about it like aliens. If, if aliens came and landed on... Uh, you know, the White House lawn is, is too overused. If it, if it landed in uh, um, uh, 1060 West S and in, in the Wrigley Field or whatever it's called now, uh, that would be an impactful uh, understanding of our place in the universe. So if we learn that God exists, there are big, big implications from that. Right. You might not like him. You might not agree with him. Uh, and he might have explanations for why you don't agree with him or like him, uh, but the, the, it would be revolutionary uh, with within the scope of everyone's mind if we all of a sudden were fully aware of uh, the existence of God. So if uh, if God exists, everything else depends for its existence and nature on God. So right. God is a creator, and so it exists because he exists, and it has its nature because he gave it that nature. Right. Right. If God exists, the ultimate reality is personal and rational and moral in nature. Mm. So it's mm. personal, rational, and moral. 
Yeah. So if we contrast that worldview, right, a worldview in which our universe is uh, the creation of a personal God with the worldview of naturalism. Yeah, something right, completely opposite. Right, which is arguably the most prominent alternative, he tells us, in Western society today, at least among intellectuals. Yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> Hasn't always been the case. So naturalism is the view that only the natural universe exists, right? So, so just the natural universe itself, there's no entity being outside of the universe, just the natural universe exists. Naturalism uh, asserts that all of reality, including us, consists at bottom of nothing more than fundamental physical particles and forces, right, operating according to the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. That's all that, that exists uh, from a naturalistic perspective, right? It denies that there is any irreducibly non-physical things, right? We don't have minds, there's no spirits, there's no souls or anything right. like that. So so nothing, you know, irreducibly non-physical. And above all, there is no, obviously, transcendent creator, right? right? Because that would be something outside of the universe, and so only the universe exists right. from a naturalistic yeah. perspective, right? We talked a little bit about this before. You know, you, you love somebody not because uh, you have a personality that that uh, that has a mind that that um, is uh, exists independently from from the 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 body fully, uh, you just pop or fizz or you have uh, some some chemical that heightens when you're around other people. And we can explain that away through survival mode. And so, uh, you know, it, you love your children not because you actually uh, love them with this kind of uh, sense of, of what has kind of been known because we've uh, existed kind of in a Western worldview for so long. Uh, but uh, But just because you're... Um, kind of hormones have taken over so that the species can survive. Mm -hmm. Why you care the species survive, I don't really know, but <laughs> it's probably the fact that uh, th those that didn't care about the species survive didn't survive. So it's just um, this kind of um, uh, uh, psychological or s social Darwinism that that uh, that is looked at and, and viewed. And again, we're those, you know, uh, I, I, I fear uh, scary movies because I fear the snake in the grass. Well, at some point in time, how did I develop fear of snake in the grass. Someone had to have that and it's written in our DNA somewhere. A scary movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we drew enough pictures. That's and right. so, you know, uh, 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 there's a lot of uh, uh, questions here of, of uh, origination for, for that. Yeah. And so, uh, and so that's where, you know, that's where he's coming from with regard to naturalism. Right. Mm -hmm. So the worldview of naturalism presents a radically different perspective on the universe and our lives than uh, the, the Christian understanding. Right. So if naturalism is correct, it follows that reality is ultimately non-personal, non-rational, and non-moral. So again, it's so just the opposite right. of the Christian worldview, right? right? So yeah. not irrational and immoral, but non-rational and non-moral. Right. And non -personal, that a bit. Which is kind of right. a, clearly a different concept than irrational and immoral. Right. right. Being irrational means that there's a standard of rationality and you're being irrespective of it. You That's know, right. Or moral. That's right. You're being ir immoral fr from it. Right. So, the, there is no standard when you're talking about right. non-moral non right. or non-rational. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, and so he's going to he's gonna really work on that particular idea. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And we did cover that aspect when we talked about um, oh, 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 Nietzsche. Uh, uh, right. You know, okay. So, yeah. so the... Yeah. the the idea of uh, that Nietzsche came uh, out of is, is this, uh, you know, <laughs> nothing nothing matters, and not only does nothing matter, it, it can't matter. Right. There's no standard of, of mattering. <laughs> <laughs> so the universe we inhabit has no ultimate meaning, purpose, direction, or significance. It came from nowhere, and it's heading nowhere. It's right. just expanding and contrasting. Uh, you know, it'll uh, have a heat death where it might start up again. Uh, if if uh, you read uh, Slaughterhouse Five, uh, it only matters what you do because you're going to be in this existence forever, expanding, contrasting uh, until you know uh, forever. <laughs> <laughs> so the only real laws governing the universe are laws of physics, which means there's no moral order behind anything. It's just kind of what you feel. It's what your biology directs you to. It's mm -hmm. what the, mm -hmm. so the the survivability of your species does. And so um, you know it, it was. It may have been, quote unquote, good for the Holocaust to happen, uh, but we view it as bad later because it just needed to happen that one time in order to tell us it was bad. So it just allowed us to survive better, wow. something along those lines. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't think I like that. <laughs> d- d- depends on on whose side of the Holocaust you're on, I guess. Uh, so the laws of physics are purely a descriptive in nature. They tell us how physical things uh, do behave, but they have nothing to say about how those things ought to behave. The mm. oughts and shoulds disappear in right. uh, naturalism. Right. The laws of physics are morally blind. Right. So I, I do this because I want to do it or... Uh, it makes the most sense uh, uh, to survivability of everyone, or uh, it benefits uh, 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 more people so that they continue to feel good so the survival of the species happens, or it makes us richer, some utilitarian idea. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you can you can always um, uh, find what, what good is in that system by appealing to, to something about uh, uh, a greater benefit, yeah, but uh, but not good in, in of itself, right? Right. right. So th- such is the perspective of naturalism, right? Mm-hmm. Now, again, this is the most prominent and intellectually consistent. There is no God worldview in our day, he tells us, right? <laughs> but to be clear, nothing he said so far is intended to refute naturalism, right? right? Basically, he was just describing it, right? Right. We added a little bit more commentary yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> so we only contrasted here, he tells us, uh, you know, the two competing worldviews and their implications so that uh, we can be clear on what's at stake here and why the existence of God is such a central and defining issue, right? right. So that's it. One of them, um, uh, non-moral, non-personal, right? The other is different because of God's existence right. from a Christian um, worldview perspective, mm-hmm. right? So with that in mind, let's turn now to consider uh, some of the reasons why the Christian worldview makes far more sense than the naturalist worldview. And he says that he's going to offer six different uh, uh, interrelated arguments for the existence of God. So in each case, he'll identify something that uh, we take for granted in our lives and explain why we need God in order to make sense of those things. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've covered this a little bit uh, before when we've talked about uh, other things like uh, Nancy Piercy's uh, um, uh, five uh, five uh, principles. And uh, so some of these might sound familiar if you've been with us for a while. If not, you can go back and check those out and um, um, we'll we'll see that he adds more and builds upon. So um, it gets heady, but at the same time, hopefully we'll break it down. That's why you pay us. (laughs) uh, So this first section is on existence, right? He calls it God and existence. And he says, here's a, a truth so obvious that it seems almost perverse he tells us to mention it and what is it something exists well, right? someone wrote a book about that and got paid a lot of money <laughs> he says even if you doubt everything else you cannot reasonably doubt that you exist right because the very fact of uh, doubting shows that something or someone is doubting right right, right. it uh, harkens back to uh you know i think therefore i am Good old descartes. descartes yeah and all that kind of Go, stuff goes right? in the woods for three days in a cabin <laughs> thinks about stuff and then comes out and there's the modern world view <laughs> amazing so you can do something in th- three days that revolutionizes the world <laughs> that's right so uh, <laughs> but for those who reflect on such matters like you know existence and that kind of stuff the question arises uh, why? Sure. Right? Why does anything exist at mm-hmm. all? So that's the issue, right? What accounts for the fact that anything at all exists? Why? Right? Why is it there? Right? And so that's what he wants us to pursue with regard to this issue of existence. Mm-hmm. All right. right. So philosophers have a special term for things that exist but didn't have to exist. So, so they they exist like you and me. Uh, but they didn't have to, right? I, I, I didn't need to be born in order for the world to continue. Yeah, and, yeah, right. uh, probably some people have wished uh, the opposites just so that their lives get better. Yeah, or or the fact is, uh, you know, I'm dependent on something else for my existence, right? right? So for, for me to exist, my parents needed to exist in right. order for me to be here. Right. So uh, so for the things that, that exist but didn't have to, it's called the word contingent. Contingent. So yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that. So contingent, there, there's your vocab word. You can write it down, <laughs> highlight it in your book. That's right. So a contingent thing is one that might not have existed, even though it does, in fact, exist. It's non-existence is logically possible. So uh, I, I, I buy a basketball to go play basketball. Uh, uh, I need that basketball to exist in order to play basketball but it doesn't mean that the basketball needs to exist. Right. It just, uh, I, I, so it was, it was, I remember getting my first basketball as a kid and it was contingent on my dad buying it for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And before he did that, at least in terms of me having one for my own, it didn't exist. Right. (laughs) Or it's contingent because in order for it 
to have not existed, you wouldn't have liked to play basketball in the future. So, well, that's true. So it needed yeah. to be non-contingent there, <laughs> but it's it, it didn't have to – it. For, for the world to continue to spin, to exist, uh, you know, you, you, you couldn't uh, pluck it out of existence. <laughs> you, you could, and it still still would work. So any uh, man-made object and all living organisms are contingent. Right. So cars, planes, trains, whatever, right? Anything. mosquitoes. Yeah. 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 So but, both man-made objects and all living organisms, right, are mm-hmm. all contingent. They're dependent on something else for their existence. Right. 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 The butterfly might... Uh, create a hurricane when he flaps his wings, but the butterfly didn't have to exist. (laughs) So the same goes for any physical or natural objects. The cosmos as a whole is an inconceivably large physical thing. And therefore it's a contingent thing. Right. So again, this, this is uh, an idea coming from the Christian worldview and also kind of the naturalist worldview. So we are uh, uh, leaving out uh, those uh, worldviews that believe that uh, the world and everything in it is just an illusion. Mm-hmm. And so we interact uh, interact with an illusion somehow. But again, to, to think, therefore I am, uh, a little bit uh, harken back to uh, Descartes there, something has to exist in s- some fashion. And so... Um, you know, that's when we get into matrix type uh, discussions and, right. and the like. But um, we're, we're, we're wanting to talk about just uh, two of them here, a, a contrast from an opposite uh, worldview of, of Christianity. So, uh, yeah, it, again, doesn't cover everything, but this keeps the <laughs> keeps the discussion uh, more narrow. <laughs> right. So we have contingent things, right? Things that are dependent on something else for their existence, right? right? Uh, oftentimes this, by the way, is contrasted with necessary existence, something that has to exist and is not uh, dependent on anything else for its existence, right? And, mm-hmm. and we're going to, you know, that's what God is all about. But right now, contingent things, right? All right, so now he moves forward with his argument. Any contingent thing needs an explanation for why it exists since it might not have existed, right? right. So, you know, if it's dependent on something else for its existence, it might not have existed. So why does it exist? Right? What's the explanation for it? That's what he's getting at here. He says that explanation can't come from the thing itself, right? Because, uh, you know, it has to come from outside of the thing if it's dependent on something else for its existence, mm-hmm. right? He says it makes no sense to say that something uh, bought, brought itself into existence, uh, since it would have to exist already <laughs> in order to do anything at all to bring itself into existence, right? right? So that w- you can't, that's right. kind of, you know, impossible, we might say. Well, right. and then there are people like Lawrence Krauss that writes books about how nothing doesn't really mean nothing. And he, when he says nothing, he, he does kind of mean nothing, but not always. And so you have the, the, the big debate with... Uh, with uh, John Lennox and, and him, and then you have uh, p- people that are kind of uh, Len- um, uh, Krauss apologists who say, well, you know, he's only talking to the layman when he says nothing. He's trying to get to convey <laughs> that aspect. But, you know, we have these particles that blink into existence out of nothing. So they they, they, um, they were, they, they, they came into the universe and they created themselves. But again, as we covered with Mitch Stokes, they come into the universe. And so to say that it came from nothing doesn't it, it ring exactly true because there is a something here already. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, again, you could have the God of the gaps uh, idea or the atheism of the gaps of, <laughs> well, we'll explain it someday through naturalist process, but you know, for them, they, they kind of need that point in order to explain uh, a, a non uh, 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 forever universe existing. And how, how did it come about? Well, it has to create itself. And so this is their kind of one special pleading area where, they say uh, something arose from nothing, or you right. have the the small speck that's uh, super dense that create that has all the matter in it, and it explodes and right. it creates everything. Right. Well, that's a really dense little point. Yeah, but where but did it come not, from? But it's still something. Right, it's, it's, it's still speck, something. Right. So the existence <laughs> of every contingent thing has to be explained by some other thing, right? In other words, if its existence is dependent on something else, then that something else is its explanation, right? That other thing must then itself either be contingent or non-contingent, right? right? <clears throat> so if the universe as a whole is contingent, there needs to be an explanation of why it exists. And that explanation cannot come from the universe itself or anything within the universe, right? <coughs> so, uh, so... Uh, the the, the 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 solar system that Earth is in uh, is contingent, and so we couldn't say that the the solar system 
um, uh, came from the earth, unless if it spun out of the earth or, or something <laughs> along those lines. Uh, so how how do we how do we get outside the universe if we're not allowed anything transcending the universe? Right. So if the universe itself is contingent, then we have to ask the question, you know, basically, um, how how what is it dependent on? Right. Right. Kind right. of thing. Right. And so turtles all the way down is the, <laughs> is the answer. One of the greatest difficulties faced by the worldview of naturalism is that it offers no explanation for the existence of the universe. Except or, turtles. Yeah, right. Except turtles, <laughs> or we haven't gotten there yet, but we'll explain it someday. Uh, you know, just, just you just have to have faith. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hold on. And thus, uh, no explanation for the existence of anything, because according to naturalism, only the universe exists. So if the universe didn't need to exist, then nothing existed, or it could have existed... Or, you know, it's so, so it, it, the universe is dependent, but then you kind of have to make it independent in order for it to exist. But right, right. That doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> so the problem is acute. Naturalism forbids any explanation for the existence of the universe since it insists there's nothing beyond the universe that could explain its existence. Right. So this is a really, you know, important Very point important, here, right? Yeah. Because, uh, if indeed the universe is all there is and the universe is contingent, that is dependent on something else, then how do we explain the existence of the universe, mm -hmm. right? If it's all that there is. Well, there has to be no explanation for it, which seems to be a, a problem, right? right? There's no explanation for why the universe is here. There's no explanation for, you know, what it's uh, contingent on. It's just here, period. And there's and so there can in fact if it's the only thing then there can't be any explanation right 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 um, so it's it's kind of thinking like uh, if if you can only explain uh, your lineage from four generations back but you are not allowed to go to the fifth generation yeah. so you're like well well because there is no fifth yeah generation. There, there is none so, yeah. so wait where'd the fourth one come from <laughs> yeah. you know, so the, the, but they're all contingent right right, yeah. right. So, so the fourth one is contingent but there's nothing that it's contingent on mm -hmm. well then how is it contingent right yeah <laughs> it's it's the argument against the uh, immaculate conception of mary well uh, mary couldn't have a, a sinless person in her in order to so she she had to be without original sin. Okay, well, what about her parents? Mm -hmm. Well, that, no, that, that's 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 where we draw the line. <laughs> okay, well, why? Okay, so uh, so in stark contrast, the Christian worldview faces no such difficulty. For the, that worldview includes three fundamental tenets: one, God exists; mm -hmm. two, it's not uh, God is not a contingent being, so it, it it doesn't depend on something coming before it in order for it to exist; right. and three. God freely chooses to use his unlimited power to bring the universe into existence. So again, God exists. God is not a contingent being. And God freely chooses to use his unlimited power to bring the universe into existence. Precisely because God is a fundamentally different kind of being than the universe, the puzzle of existence finds a coherent answer. The universe is not self-existent. It has to derive its existence from some other source, but God, by his very nature, is absolutely self-existent. So the Christian worldview can account for the existence of the universe in a way that the naturalist worldview simply cannot. So, uh, you know, the, the God exists. He is outside the universe, and he's different than the universe. So he's different than the, the physical reality that, that um, you, know, we, you know, we normally interact with and experience. And so because he's a different type of being, he doesn't have to be contingent on something because he exists outside the universe. And by creating the universe, he's able to then uh, bring the, the, the er, by, by being powerful enough, he's able to bring, um, by, by who he is, he's able to bring the universe into, into existence. existence. Yeah. So that, that's, that's the, uh, the kind of uh, the Christian argument. Right. So in sum, the obvious truth that something exists, then he tells us, gives us a compelling reason to believe in God. Right. And uh, existence itself then points us to the existence of God. Right. And right. so, yeah, so that is an important uh, uh, point that uh, he wants us to see. The very fact that something exists, the universe exists, points us and it's contingent. Right. Mm -hmm. Points us to, to God. Right. So existence itself is an argument for God. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> So the uh, the Christian, however, can ride the argument further down the line. Oh, really? 
Keep going, baby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For not only does the universe exist, it exists at multiple levels as a harmony of unity and plurality. Mm. Of unity, of oneness, and plurality, of, of diverseness. Right. At a basic level, the universe contains countless individual physical particles, but they all behave in a unified fashion. All right, so that's the plurality, all of the particles, right? Right. And how they behave then is... In, the, in this unified fashion, obeying the same physical laws. Mm. There's both the unity, the laws, right. and the plurality, the particles. Okay. So it's a, it's a kind of a concept called the one and the many. Uh, it's it's an issue for people, yeah, and not it's for us both, Christians. Right? <laughs> yeah. right. So at a higher level, the human race is made up of billions of diverse individuals, but we're unified by a common human nature that distinguishes us from other creatures like chimpanzees and manatees and insects and creepy things and bananas <laughs> and palm fronds. Uh, you know, we're ninety four percent like uh, the 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 monkey in our DNA structure, whatever that means. I think it's like ninety eight or something. Like yeah, that. we're ninety four percent like a banana. Yeah, think, we're like more that. like bananas. And then uh, uh, palm palm trees actually have more than us, so they're a more advanced life form. They're our rulers. Yeah. So whenever you you know you experience a, a hiccup in your life. Blame it on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have both unity and diversity, right, in the, that exists in the universe in general. And then specifically, even if we go up a higher, he tells us, with human beings, we have both unity and diversity, right? right. We're, we're uh, unified in terms of we have a, we're all alike in terms of having a human nature, but we're all individuals and so we're diverse. And so mm -hmm. he says, since the universe exists as a harmony of unity and plurality, we should expect the source of exi its existence to exist, uh, you know, in a similar type of harmony of unity and plurality, right? And, of course, that's exactly what the Christian view of God maintains, right? The absolute being, God, is both one and many. He is an ultimate unity, mm -hmm. one God, right? And an ultimate plurality, three distinct persons in perfect human uh, uh, harmony. Right. And so we have, you know, the explanation of the universe. God uh, is the the universe that he created in a, in a certain degree or aspect reflects who he is. Yeah. And, right? and the creation that he created. Yeah. So he uses information because he is the ultimate source of information. Uh, he uh, communicates uh, through the laws of logic and so the the world is expressed through those laws of logic, and they're consistent because he's consistent. And so that's why you kind of need this this one in the many. And uh, um, Eli Alla uh, had a really good interview, and I forget the person's name or book, but uh, on Revealed Apologetics. And I'll link those uh, the video and the book uh, in the show notes uh, below. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think here we'll probably have to stop and take a breather because yeah. uh, we get into uh, God and different uh, aspects that he brings into uh, uh, that existence that we experience or have that um, both naturalism and Christianity kind of compare and, and contrast and, and, and how they interact with it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll stop here. We got about a quarter of the way through the chapter. Uh, again, uh, heady subject, but uh, always check out the, the short clips, and we do that for every single um, episode that we do. And uh, we hope you enjoyed our interview with uh, Dr. Kostenberger, and so you can go uh, back and uh, check that out. That was really awesome. I got a lot of good, like, oh, wow, you got him. I can't believe it. And we, <laughs> I, from talking with people, we must have caught him at just the right time. So mm -hmm. we appreciate him and uh, all of you for watching, listening, uh, writing uh, fun comments that uh, make me think and uh, um, just uh, all the good feedback that I've gotten. And so we appreciate it. Uh, continue to share, liking, subscribing. Uh, just get the word out and um, uh, join us on our book club. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>